Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Jennifer Austin Folks, and I manage Google's Ocean program. And I'm here with Richard Beavers, who's director of the Catlin Sea View Survey. And today, we're going to talk about underwater street view. To start off, I think it's helpful to give a little bit of background on our ocean program. So it started over six years ago when Sylvia Earle, who's a famous ocean explorer, was at a conference in Spain getting an award. And she went on stage. And in the audience was one of the founders of Keyhole, which became Google Earth. And she said, you know, John, I love Google Earth. My grandsons fly all around the planet. But you should really call it Google Dirt, because you're missing three quarters of it. And he laughed, and everybody laughed. And then he had Sylvia come and give a tech talk at Google. And that recruited many of us to come together to work on how you would add an explorable ocean to Google Earth. And we launched that four years ago with Jimmy Buffett and Al Gore. And since then, we've worked with many groups like NOAA, Scripps, Navy, JEPCO to improve our underwater map of the ocean. And you can see at the very top is San Francisco Bay. And right off the coast is a canyon called Monterey Bay Canyon that's deeper than the Grand Canyon. And what we spent the last several years doing is improving this map of the ocean. And that gives you a sense. Anyone can now hold the ocean in your hands and our products in Google Earth for uh, Android, phones, tablets. But what you couldn't do until the end of last year is actually see what it looks like underwater. And this has been what Richard and I have been working together on, which we're really excited to talk to you about today. And I'm going to start off with just a short video that we featured at our launch that introduces. So that's what we launched at the end of last year. And our goal is really to make all of our MAPS products more comprehensive with more ocean data. This is the blog post from our launch. The turtle was seen everywhere. And our goal was really to take you from your home in Street View and Google Maps to a turtle's home. And I'm going to show you how it looks in our new MAPS product. Click on the little C inside. It takes you into Street View. And you can visit the turtle. You can go halfway in, halfway out of the water. You can visit the Heron Island Resort. You can see where you might like to be sitting, reading a book, testing out your next vacation, looking out at the beautiful Great Barrier Reef, flying underwater, and visiting all the marine life that lives there. So we're really excited about this. We're excited about adding underwater to our Street View product, product. And we've released about six places so far, one in the Philippines, three in the Great Barrier Reef, and two in Hawaii. And I've actually snorkeled myself at the Hanama Bay location in Oahu and seen changes over the last only six years uh, that are pretty dramatic and all the more reason why we need to capture imagery right now and bring it to the rest of the world. So, as I've heard from many scientists, from Sylvia Earle, you know, she has seen in her lifetime 50 years of diving. Uh, you know, most of the big fish are gone. Half of coral reefs are gone. The oceans are warmer. They're more acidic. And coral reef decline is expected to continue uh, in our lifetime. And the chief scientist on Richard's project, Dr. Ove Ho Gildberg from the University of Queensland, published a paper in Science 10 years ago 
showing the effects of ocean acidification. So you see a healthy reef on the left. In the middle, uh, the um, atmospheric carbon dioxide is at a higher level. The oceans become more acidic, and eventually corals die. And this last figure from his science article shows in blue the areas in the world, the world map, where coral reefs can actually live. And as the atmospheric CO2 increases, the little, as noted by the little white number, the areas in blue shrink. So the areas where corals can live um, are rapidly declining. And um, so it's all the more reason why we're so excited that Richard is using our products to feature this beautiful underwater imagery to really ignite excitement in the world. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Richard. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, there's a very serious side to this, this project, but there's also um, an amazingly fun side to the project. And um, as you could probably get an idea from the underwater scooters that we were driving in that video. Um, for me, I mean, if you like a challenge, this is arguably the most exciting time to be in ocean conservation. What happens here in the next 10 years um, is likely to affect our oceans for the next 10,000 years. Um, so it is a, a, an immense challenge that we've got ahead of us, but really it's through technology that we can find the solutions. Now this is an image that we took of the, the Great Barrier Reef. It's just one reef on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, we took this image about two months ago um, during a major survey that we were doing there. And it just shows the kind of devastation that is happening. The Great Barrier Reef has lost 53% of its corals over the last 30 years alone. And this kind of information just isn't publicly out there. And it's because there haven't been the communication tools up until now, really, of communicating this. Um, so it's why Street View um, and getting the, this kind of imagery out there is, is critically important, as well as getting the highly engaging content, um, as you saw in, the, saw in the videos. Now, we set up. Um, our project really to reveal the reefs of the world. Now, the biggest single issue facing our oceans currently is the fact that they're out of sight and out of mind. The, really, the, the issue is that people can't, well, don't want to protect um, anything that they can't see. And it's vital that we reveal the oceans to the world, which is why we set up our not-for-profit organization about three years ago. 99.9% .9 of people on the planet do not dive, and they probably never will. But there's no reason why we can't take them virtual, virtual diving. And this is really why we set up the organization. Um, there's no excuse anymore for not having the oceans accessible to everyone um, with internet access. If Google can do this in the terrestrial environment, we thought there's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't be doing this underwater. So we went about designing a camera that could do this. Now, the cameras um, for underwater work very differently for, from cameras above. Um, we couldn't use just the existing Street View camera and take that underwater. Um, we had to use much, much wider angle lenses um, to work in low visibility conditions. Obviously, um, we had to replace the car with an underwater scooter, but we still got the same driver. Um, the way we've worked the camera is you've got three cameras at the front, uh, which are all firing simultaneously. And as we travel along, we take a shot every three seconds at about two meters above the, the ocean floor. Now, when you're on expedition, um, you're going to have flooded cameras. So we wanted to design a camera um, that could work that we didn't have to open while we were on expedition, because that's when you're going to have the problems. Um, so we actually worked with a system where we've got an underwater tablet, which you can see just at the back of the scooter there, that operates the cameras. It controls the ISOs and the speed, so we can make adjustments as we're uh, motoring along the reef. Now, typically on a, on a on dive, we'll cover two kilometers and we'll take 3,000 images, which are then stitched to, to create 1,000 panoramas. And these can all be uploaded. At the moment, we've been focusing on the most engaging content, but it really is um, a case of trying to reveal as much as we possibly can. Now, this just gives you an indication of three of the shots. We've got two 
pointing slightly up to the left and to the right, and one pointing directly down. Now, the reason why we went for this configuration is because to monitor reefs, you need that downward facing uh, image because that's the one that has been traditionally used in the, in the past, a downward facing shot of, of um, reefs and other ocean environments. So we set up the configuration in this format and then pointed the camera slightly forward um, so we've got a black spot behind where the dive is hidden. And we have to stitch that um, for the end result. Now the end result is to create this, this is an equirectangular image, but it is when you search for um, panoramic images underwater on, on the uh, internet, there are very, very few out there, and especially a full 360 image. This suddenly communicates in a way that's never been done before exactly what that environment is. Um, a scientist or anybody can look at that environment and see what the structure's like, how healthy it is, but more importantly, we can also look at it and monitor it for change. Now, Jennifer is going to talk through some of the challenges we had. Um, once we'd collected this imagery, it was then a case of trying to get it into Street View. And there's an amazing tool that allowed us to do this. Yes, so thanks, Richard. And so we basically had worked with Richard to help him use our business photos tool to upload his imagery. And so anyone who joins our business photography program, you can up upload your own panoramic imagery as this garden center in New York has done. I think once you have that panoramic imagery in Street View, you can then use the Street View API to embed that content on your own website. And you can see we've done that here with our maps gallery at maps.google.com slash ocean. Here's some of the code from our developer site that shows you how you can do this. And another partner of Richard's Terramar project, which is another nonprofit, has embedded Richard's beautiful imagery in a sort of gallery context using the Straight View API on their own website for educational purposes for students and teachers to go there and get quick access to that imagery. Now the Catlin CV survey isn't really just about revealing the oceans um, to the world, um, especially coral reefs, but it's, I mean, that's half of the story. The rest of the story is about creating um, a scientific baseline with which to monitor change. Now it was when we initially showed the, the first images that we were capturing to one of the world's leading coral reef scientists, he saw the potential of this imagery. Um, because traditionally they've been taking, sending a diver down and doing a 50 meter dive, taking photographs of, of the seafloor, and that was the way of monitoring these environments. Suddenly we have a tool for doing two kilometers at a time and capturing the full 360 env environment and it allowed you to, sh to see exactly what was going on in that uh, entire environment. So we set about uh, establishing a, sci a strict scientific protocol for all our data capture and that's what we have been doing over the last five months on the Great Barrier Reef, visiting 32 different reefs and now we've expanded the project over to pilots in the Caribbean and other areas. Now, all these images are going to be made freely available for scientists to analyze, and we'll come along onto the, some of the analysis in, in a minute. In a minute. Um, and we're launching the, the Catlin um, Global Reef Record later on this year, which will have all of the images, and not just the most engaging images, um, available for scientists to study, as well as the pu public to monitor the change. Now, image analysis is critical to this project. Um, we currently have in the region of 150,000 images that we've taken over the last five months, and this figure is going to grow exponentially as we expand the project. Now, this is just a section of one of the downward facing images, um, but Scripps um, over here in the US has developed some amazing um, image recognition technology that will allow us to identify species of corals on reefs. And the, um, the data that we collected from the, the Great Barrier Reef is currently being processed as we speak. But currently, this is restricted to the downward facing camera. We currently have no way of, of um, auto analyzing the rest of the 360. And that's something we desperately need um, to develop. 
um, so we can get the full picture. We're also working, just on, back on the science, on the 3D modeling of the reef. We've got stereo cameras, which are adding an extra layer of data that hopefully when we can combine with satellite data will provide us with hugely powerful planning tools for global reefs. Now, as I said, this project is 50% science and 50% communication and engagement. The, and really, that's what sets this project apart from sort of most projects, is this focus on the, the community and the engagement. There's really very little point in doing science if it's only getting out to a few hundred people, especially not to the public and not to the policy makers. And this is where the collaboration with Google is, is absolutely vital to this project because instead of these images being seen by a few hundreds or even thousands of people, we're getting out to tens or even hundreds of millions. Now we've got over three million people following us on Google+. Um, we do our regular um, photo spheres. We've got um, daily updates from the field. Um, we've just got, I've literally just come off an expedition at the moment. Um, and we do these daily updates while we're, we're out there. And it's, it's, it's a hugely powerful tool, especially when you use some of the other um, features of Google+. We've been doing a lot of fun, um, if slightly stressful, underwater hangouts, um, patching in live to conferences um, from underwater. And the one on the left-hand side was one we did. Um, it was over um, at our Monterey launch, which unfortunately was middle of the night for us on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, but fortunately, a turtle turned up halfway through the, uh, uh, the show, which made for added interest. But again, this is an incredible um, tool that we haven't even unlocked, you know, scratched the surface of the potential. If we can get this out to schools, for example, and engage school children all over the world with people that are scientists underwater carrying out the surveys, it's, it's just an amazing tool. Also, the immersive photospheres, I don't know whether you want to show one probably that we loaded yesterday, is a great way of just having hero images that can really capture an environment, a whole area, just in a single image. This is one that we took, I don't know whether I can scroll around, of a uh, wreck in Aruba um, about three weeks ago, but you're starting to get the idea. And some of our divers on the survey. And we'll be posting a lot more of these photospheres. And Jennifer's going to talk a little bit more about photospheres. So um, my colleague uh, Evan has been driving the uh, creation of this ability to take 360s from the Android phone. Um, and when you take a 360, you can actually then upload and share that to Google Maps. And I'm particularly excited because I just discovered that there's actually an underwater case for the Nexus 4. And I will be diving in a couple weeks in Bali uh, to do some testing of collecting my own underwater photospheres. So I'm very excited about that. And after you upload them to Maps, then you can also share them on your own website and embed them for you know, whatever travel communication uh, interest you have. Yes, we have been cheating slightly with photospheres at the moment using our SV2 camera rather than the Android, but we will be taking a lot more Android ones uh, coming up soon. Now, as we said, there's, there's very much a serious side to this, this project. Over the next three years, we're planning to try and capture a, a baseline for the uh, coral reefs of, of the world. So we are focusing on the Americas this year. Then we're off to Asia um, and the Coral Triangle, which is really the epicenter of coral reefs worldwide. And then we're off to the Indian Ocean, um, right up to the Red Sea. So hopefully within the next three years, you'll be able to go diving virtually anywhere in the, uh, in the world. Now, the decline is so rapid of coral reefs that we feel this is very much a, a race against time. And we want to go out there to record and reveal coral reefs so that the, the change can be monitored and we can look for areas of resilience and work out what are the critical areas to protect. And that is what this project is all about. Now, we need more developers. Um, we've had some 
amazing support from the developers that have been involved on the project. Um, from developing the apps to control the cameras, um, to really looking at the technology for the image recognition, to so many different aspects of this project, um, the stitching technology, etc. Um, technology very much is the solution here. Um, it's the only way that we can communicate to enough people around the planet about what is going on and carry out the science that's required in the required time frame. There are three specific areas um, that we need to be focusing on. And the first of these areas is engaging as many people on the planet to help us in the gathering of the data. Now, we've got our SV2 cameras, which are going to be limited to the number of um, sites that we can cover. Now, if it was possible to engage the 10 million divers around the planet using their existing technology with simple housings, to create baselines of their own or go back and visit our baselines um, and monitor change and notify us of that change, we would have a hugely powerful tool. And this is something that we very much want to focus on over the next sort of 12 months. The second area is um, one that I mentioned earlier, and that is the image recognition. Once we've collected the data, we need to be able to analyze it and analyze it, it quickly. With potentially millions of, of images, we need to develop the software to look at the full 360 and find ways of doing that. Now, this can be through just development of the image recognition, or we can engage citizen scientists. Now, because of the numbers of people that we can talk to through this project, thanks to the collaboration with Google, if we can collectively bring the citizen scientists together to start analyzing these Im images and um, develop ways of educating the computers through that analysis, again, that will be a hugely powerful tool and a great way of engaging people globally. The third area is very much on the engagement side of things. How do we use this imagery in the best possible way to engage people, whether it's virtual experiences in, in exhibitions, it's, it's headsets, it's just any way of engaging. We have amazing engaging content, but we need to communicate it to as many people around the planet as we possibly can. And that's what we're looking for help for. What we need, really, is the developers, and it's really developers and, and the technology that are going to provide the solutions to this. Um, if you are interested in getting involved in the project, I'll be at the, the stand where you've got the camera on display at the Google Maps um, area. Um, or you can contact us through the Google Plus page um, at Catlin Seaview Survey. Or also just contact us through the CatlinCviewSurvey.com. Thank you very much. And I'd just like to, to also conclude that um, this project wouldn't have been possible without uh, my colleague Steve Silverman at Google, who's helped me manage this. So mm. Thanks to Steve. Yeah, so if there are any questions about this project, um, there's a mic or raise your hand and I'll repeat it. Uh, and if there, okay, there's one. Hi, my name is Daniel. Um, I have a couple different questions. One is you said, it takes us a, a shot every three seconds, and you do two kilometers on a run. What, what would limit you to two kilometers? That's only about six minutes, right? Sorry? Uh, no, Is we're actually, um, because it's an underwater environment, you, you're going along very slowly. OK. So typically, we'll cover two kilometers in about 40 to 45 minutes. OK. Um, we restrict that because of the, the battery life of the, the underwater scooter and also just keeping within safety protocols. But mm -hmm. the idea is if we could develop the AUV version in the same way that we've got cars that um, don't need drivers, we can go off for a 12-hour uh, run and get a lot more data. So that's, again, something that we're working on. Um, how many cameras do you have? Four, uh, of which two have never been in the water. One of them's on the stand. So it is a very young project. Um, we only launched it back in September last year, um, and we're developing it as fast as we possibly can. 
Do you have plans to get more cameras or is it a financial? Or it's a financial restriction at the moment. The more cameras that we have, the idea is to be able to bring third party organizations, so people like NOAA um, and other organizations who have skilled divers that can carry out the data collection for us if we can provide them with the tools. So yes, if there was a way of getting more cameras, yes, we would be wanting it. How much is a camera? Um, the cameras, it's, it's around the 50,000 um, a piece mark. US? US. Uh, one question to the Google side. Is there any business case in it? Um, I think our motivation in this has been uh, sort of making our maps more comprehensive. And I think as you may have seen in the keynote, I mean, there are a lot of references to it. I think it's very powerful and you know, excites the imagination about what could be possible. So I think from my motivation, it's been very, you know, uh, sort of inspired by Sylvia with knowing comes caring, caring there's hope. So there, there, there are no ads placed or something? Uh, right now, I mean, I don't have a crystal ball, but <laughs> uh, not, that's not my current plans with it. Hi, my name is David. Do you capture other data like temperature and acidity, or do you correlate with satellite data? Yes, a lot of the data that we're capturing is related to the, the image data, so depth loggers, et cetera, tilt and, and that, but we're also doing temperature. Um, we're collecting less of the, the other data at the moment because we're not in environments long enough for that data to be useful. We're looking to leave long-term monitoring data in sites to create sites that we go back and revisit over time, but that's something that we need to add to the project. Hi, um, you mentioned earlier that you were uh, thinking about doing like an autonomous sort of uh, camera. Is that about right? Is what you said? Yes. Um, how do you plan on like getting over the, the problems with GPS signals and just other RF frequencies underwater? Um, to be honest, I'm probably not the person to, to, to ask about that, but um, we've been working with the University of Sydney who developed a, an AUV that is capable of hugging the substrate um, two meters above this, the substrate, and it will go for 12 hours at a time. That's the kind of vehicle that is perfect for this kind of surveying, and they've managed to work out a, a very accurate way of, of getting the GPS locations because it's currently being used for just that single downward uh, monitoring of the substrate rather than full 360. So we know the technology is there, it's just a case of uh, getting it to work with our current camera technology. Hi, I work in a science museum, the Lawrence Hall of Science at Berkeley, and uh, this is more of a question for Google because uh, the project I'm working on is uh, stereoscopic 3D visualizations of lake ecosystems. So are there any plans of doing a street view, and, and the lake that we're doing is Lake Tahoe, so it's, it's to uh, empower people to look at the dynamic and uh, nature of our freshwater ecosystems. So, and I can actually see a business case for doing a Lake Tahoe underwater street view. Um, have you guys considered freshwater ecosystems? Because you're, you're C, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, so primarily we've been, you know, in the beginning of this project, so we've primarily been working with Richard and the Catlin Sea View, but I would imagine in the future, you know, as they get more cameras, potentially they could potentially loan one to somebody who you know, wanted to do those sorts of lake collects, and um, there should be no problem featuring it in that business photos tool, just, of, just as they've featured their imagery. So in theory, it's, uh, it's possible today. Wonderful, thank you. Yes, we've already started testing in other environments, um, you know, right down from sort of Sydney Harbour through to sort of mangrove areas. Um, a lot of the restrictions are down to visibility and making sure you're getting the best possible visibility. But we're also looking at, you know, other low light cameras that will really maximize the, the imagery that we get back. So it's of scientific um, use and also is, is highly engaging because we need it to be highly engaging for it to get the right messages out. Yeah, that's one reason why I picked Tahoe, because it's so blue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, I was wondering how accurate your GPS information is and if you're able to tie the locations of the images to uh, navigational map datum uh, 
other than that, that are more net from a navigation uh, vessel navigation standpoint? Yes, I mean, currently we've been using the sort of standard scientific protocol, which is the trailing, because we're in eight, eight meters of water. Okay. We can trail a buoy behind us at a fixed di um, okay. distance. So that's how we're gathering all the data currently, and obviously we can match that up with uh, other data sources. Okay, thanks. Um, my question is mostly with the specification of your vehicle, like uh, how, how long is the battery life and how much is the storage and how often do you have to uh, replace the storage and like uh, get a new... Yeah, a typical day for us is um, we'll set out very early on in the morning and we'll plan to do three dives in a day. You do two dives back to back from a boat and uh, we change the batteries of the scooters over um, after each dive. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the batteries in the, the cameras, for example, the orb unscrews off mm -hmm. and we charge that up overnight, download the data, clear the cards, and then we're ready to go the following morning and that will do us the full three, three dives. So each dive is like 30 minutes? Each dive is normally, is normally an hour by the time we get down, carry out the transect, and then get, get up to the surface again. So um, in each uh, cycle, how much data do you collect? How many? It's, well, it will be 3,000, well, normally about three to 4,000 um, images per camera. Okay. All right, thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you.